All righty. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for this um, special session to uh, celebrate the work of Stephen Peck. Um, my name is Melissa Leilani Larson. I am the incoming president of the Association for Mormon Letters. And I'm really excited to be um, part of this conference and to talk about some really great literature and writers with you today. Um, I'm going to turn the time over to our panel moderator, Kylie Turley, and um, enjoy. Oh, I'll say really quickly too, that if you have any questions or comments for the panel, please um, put them in the chat and I will be sharing those as they come through with the panel. Thanks very much. So we are excited to be here today. This is going to be a great discussion, I'm sure. Um, I am personally excited to be here. I just think the world of Steve Peck and his writing, I've taught it for a number of years in my class. Um, I have made the mistake of teaching his creative nonfiction with his fiction, and students have a hard time differentiating between the two, no matter how well I label them. Um, we're actually going to begin with a recording from Rosalind Welch. Rosalind Welch is an independent scholar working in Latter-day Saint literature, scripture, and theology. She holds a PhD in early modern English literature from the University of California at San Diego. She's the author of Ether, A Brief Theological Introduction. Her work has also appeared in BYU Studies, Dialogue Element, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, Mormon Studies Review, and other journals and edited volumes. She lives in St. Louis, Missouri with her husband and four children. And we are sad that she couldn't be here with us in person over Zoom, but we're glad that she recorded her presentation beforehand. So I will go ahead and share my screen um, and play her presentation. Hi, my name is Rosalind Welch. Um, it is my privilege to be recording this talk for the Association for Mormon Letters in this session, recognizing the contributions of Steve Peck. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Kylie Turley in particular for inviting me to speak today. Join me aboard a cosmic arc, cruising the multiverse from cosmos to cosmos in search of Mormonism. We're not looking for Mormonism as it is here and now, or as it was, or as it will be. We're looking for what it could be, or better, what it could do in every and any world. What could Mormonism do in a world without Christendom, for instance? Or what could Mormonism accomplish in a society without symbolic language? What are Mormonism's powers in a universe with no homo sapiens? Taken together, the answers to these questions and a thousand more, remember, we're on an arc cruising the multiverse, constitute the virtual body of Mormonism, the powers attendant upon Mormonism as a complex assemblage of forms, narratives, and energies. From the top of our arc, we release doves that fly off in search of that virtual body. They return with leafy branches new discoveries of the powers intrinsic to, though often latent within, Mormonism. Very often these doves are works of speculative fiction or narrative. It's my thesis today that Stephen Peck is our premier writer of the Mormon virtual. Like all actual entities brought into particular form by a series of contingent events, Mormonism nevertheless contains vast worlds of unrealized possibility within it. Peck's writing sails into the multiverse and returns with leafy tidings. Oh, Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth, etc. The first thing we learn from Peck's discoveries is that Mormonism's virtual body isn't really about Mormonism. It's about the cosmos itself. Today, I'll briefly summarize four of the discoveries retrieved by Peck's work. Discoveries about the universe, the multiverse, revealed by the stories and tools of our theology. In the interest of time, I'll leave it to you to flesh out the theological and literary connections. 
So number one, matter is vibrant, to borrow the title of a wonderful book by Jane Bennett. Matter vibrates, quite literally. But beyond that, matter is vibrant in as much as it is intrinsically active and responsive, generative, and free in certain senses. This discovery is incompatible with views of matter as inert at best and corrupt at worst, mere stuff in need of the discipline of an ideal form. Rather, vibrant materialism gives us a world that is open, unfolding, and iterative, giving itself to creation and recreation. It is this capacity of matter that is harnessed in Gilda Trillum's experimental novels, which are composed simply of long lists of juxtaposed substances and objects that nevertheless generate tremendous action, energy, emotion, and suspense. Number two, life unlocks matter. Peck's materialism focuses singularly on biological life. Biological life claims pride of place because among the various arrangements and formations of matter constituting the universe, life possesses an unparalleled ability to unlock matter's own virtual powers. Latent in matter is an intrinsic capacity for forming novel alliances and generating emergent features. Life harnesses this power to produce ever more intricate and detailed organic forms in a process of ongoing progression we call evolution. Evolution is teleological in the sense that it works to solve local problems that challenge organisms, but it remains generally open and undetermined. Peck's writing is never better than in his thick description of evolved ecologies, which in their networked complexity instantiate deep time while opening to the emergence of the future. Note that evolved ecologies may be social as well as organic. One of his best accounts of evolution, to my mind, is the description of Gilda Trillum's world-famous badminton stroke, the Trillum Lift. Number three, agency grows up to be love. Among the powers that life calls forth from the virtual dimension of matter is agency. Agency is what allows an organism to organize itself towards some telos or purpose most fundamentally to obtain and regulate energy. When agency evolves sufficient complexity and scope, it can draw actors together in federations of mutuality and care. We then recognize it as love. Agency is thus fully immanent, distributed through the material networks within and among agents, material in the sense that it resides in bodies, which themselves are networked assemblages. Peck's disgusting yet moving account of Gilda Trillum's nourishment on rat vomit illustrates this expansion of agency from the basic food-seeking behavior of individual organisms into ethically complex self-sacrificial love that binds many creatures together. Finally, number four, God evolves. The highest manifestation of complex agency and love is God. Peck's fiction shows us Mormonism's power to imagine evolved divinity, fully material gods entangled in space-time. We see God as an entity both acting and being acted upon, whose telos or purpose, whose work and glory, as we might put it, is to glorify others. God fosters other agents collaboration with time and matter to realize new horizons of the virtual, in particular, powers that enable relationality. God as an emergent actor in the universe has barely been thinkable up to this moment in time. It is only just beginning to emerge from the plane of the virtual into the realm of the actual. Mormonism may be an indispensable midwife to this emerging God. In this vein, Pet gives us Gilda's gorgeous evolution into the shepherdess and goddess of the rat choirs, not because they worshiped her, but because she helped them. 
Yesterday, I sat on a riverbank with my daughter. I felt an ant crawling up my thigh, and I brushed her off with a quick movement. The ant must have been injured by my hand because she moved haltingly across the hot sand. A tiger beetle, its impressive carapace striped with bronze, approached and began attacking the ant. The beetle lunged repeatedly, weakening her, and then it took the ant between its jaws as she struggled for long moments. Finally, in an instant, the ant was consumed. The beetle then carefully searched for and ingested each of the ant's legs and antennae, which had been severed in the struggle. I watched this drama play out with Peckian eyes, and I saw the cosmos in a grain of sand. I understood the beetle to be exercising a form of purposive agency arising from the marvelous complexity of its biological form. I imagined the further evolution of this beetle's kind and envisioned the expansion of its powers of agency to achieve cooperation and alliance with other organisms, perhaps one day endowing it with a kind of love. I imagined beetle and ant foraging in concert on a riverbank, like the scriptural lion with the lamb, together ushering in an insect millennium. Steve Peck, tell me, who is the shepherdess of beetles? I'm sure if Rosalind were here, we would all want to applaud wildly. I was scribbling notes as fast as I could. Um, next, we will have Mattathias seeing Goldberg Westwood. His title is Ecologician, Steve Peck's Rooted Branching Transplantable Epistemology of Relationships. Mattathias was born in the shadow of the Wasatch Mountains and grew tall near where the, and I have to make sure I'm saying these words right, Olentangy River runs into the Seattle. Did I say those right, I hope? Close enough. Rest. Thanks, Mattathias. He loves stories, whether long or short, and trees, whether short or tall. He's returned to the mountainsides and is often lost in thought among them. Hello. So uh, I'm very honored to be part of this panel today and celebrate the fantastic literary contributions of Steve Peck. Uh, alongside some of my own uh, literary heroes within Mormon studies, Jenny Webb, Rosalind Welch, George Hanley, Hailey Turley. Um, especially in the specific purpose of honoring Steve with the Smith Pettit Award for his contributions to Mormon literature uh, over the past several decades. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is the, the way in which uh, Steve's literary output models for us uh, a particular kind of epistemology or way of knowing um, that I call ecological epistemology, right? Uh, rooted in relationship and in the interaction of different agentive members of a network. Um, of course, epistemology is one of the root questions of Mormonism, perhaps even more so than other faith traditions. The question of what is truth and how to determine for ourselves uh, truth in a world filled with competing and conflicting narratives and identities. Central to our identity as Mormons is uh, Joseph Smith's personal quest to uh, pin down the truth um, by going into a grove of trees, uh, 
crucially a living, growing network in order to offer his uh, petition for greater knowledge. And I see that uh, event reflected cascadingly throughout what Steve has offered us uh, in his novels, poems, essays, and short stories. Um, over and over and over in these works, we are asked why we believe what we believe, what has led us to the conclusions we've made, and most crucially, what will we do when we encounter information that challenges or complicates our assumptions about the world in which we live. Because uh, Peck's epistemology is rooted in the reality that our assumptions will be challenged, that none of our certainties uh, can absolutely hold up um, under what we will experience. Um, and given this onslaught of contradictory and confusing experience, how, how are we supposed to process and come to any sort of conclusions? Um, and I think really what Steve gives us is uh, not, um, not any core uh, universal structure that's supposed to weather all challenges, but rather, uh, as I said in my title, a transplantable epistemology that is able to integrate and adapt under the stresses of contradictory information rather than cracking and collapsing. Um, this is an epistemology that rather than rejecting contradiction, uh, revels in new information and the development of new understandings and um, sees in that new information, crucially the ability to construct new relationships of knowledge um, that are not just conceptual relationships between different ideas, but relationships between different members of an environment and of an ecosystem. Um, and to explore this a little bit more, I would like to uh, talk in particular about three short stories by Steve, all of which are available to read for free online. Um, obviously, covering the complete Peckian literary output uh, is far beyond any of us. Um, but I'll, I'll try my hand at addressing how this epistemology is framed within three works. Uh, there's a trilogy of short stories uh, that Peck wrote um, and published online in 2014, 2015-ish um, about uh, these questions of epistemology and the development of new, especially moral and ethical frameworks for being um, and how individuals such as us can transform their paradigms through exposure to new information and new experiences. They are first, uh, the quite aptly titled, How the Mother of Vampiro Rojo de Santanas Died at the Hands of the Ethicalist Thing, its sequel, Emergence, and then the final uh, completion of the trilogy in Incomplete Slaughter. And these three short stories uh, take us through a cascading set of consequences from uh, 
a tiny seed of experience um, as one individual considers the possibility that there are other ways to be than those included within her society's framework of assumption. Um, so to begin with, um, I'll try to discuss these providing as few spoilers as possible, but beware listeners, uh, there are some risks. You could stop listening and just go to Steve Pecknick and find the stories for yourself uh, if you're worried about that. Um, so uh, our first story concerns how the mother of Vampiro Rojo de Santanas died at the hand of the ethicless thing. And the central uh, consideration uh, that I think we must take here is the ethicless thing of the title. Um, this ethicless thing is a consciousness, um, in particular, a computational consciousness, an artificial intelligence, um, one might say. Although, what necessarily is artificial about a consciousness that perceives itself as compared to another consciousness uh, is a question worth asking and is a question that is at the root of the epistemological questions in the story. Um, Ethicless is, of course, a value uh, term placed on the assumption that there are you know, other ethical beings um, and that this, this being is ethicless um, and, and raises the question, right? How, how do we know um, what is ethical? Of course, this is a question that human consciousness has considered and debated for about as far as we have written record. Um, as anyone who has read, for example, the dialogues of Plato will recognize. But the ways in which the contradictory ethics of different types of being and different consciousnesses come into conflict and seek mutual understanding um, in this story is crucial to, again, this ecological epistemology, right? That uh, individual consciousnesses are seeking greater understanding of each other. Um, and in this process of seeking understanding and encountering one another are constantly confronted by unexpected information, unexpected experience, unexpected action by other existing beings. Um, and often uh, the response which the characters in these stories take to um, this experience is to try to close off an experience which has yielded unexpected or contradictory information. But over and over throughout uh, this particular trilogy, Peck explores the ways in which opening oneself to this contradiction rather than closing it off um, allows oneself to expand one's knowledge of the universe. Um, but this expansion it, it is not without risk. Um, and indeed, in the course of these stories, um, we see that the, the cost both of seeking new experience and the cost of closing oneself off to this experience um, are often hard to tell apart as uh, artificial intelligences and uh, biological intelligence compete to understand each other and to to make sense of their differing value frameworks for understanding uh, their own experience. Um, I recognize that my uh, remarks regarding uh, Peck's exploration of this increased consciousness and of uh, these encounters 
aren't fully satisfying uh, in the absence of the full details of the uh, encounter and of the lived experience uh, and ecology, which uh, Peck manages to draw in uh, to these worlds, which have sprung from his imagination. Um, and I strongly encourage anyone listening to, to look to these specific stories and to consider how they uh, call our own moral frameworks, our own ethic and ethicalessness into question and how they might teach us uh, how to truly know one another. Thank you, Mattathias. That's very thought provoking. Um, the relationality seems to go along with what Rosalind was talking about as well. So I think we'll, no doubt that will come up again. Um, our third panelist today is Jenny Webb. Jenny Webb's research focuses on the intersection of theology, LDS scripture, and literature. Her most recent publication is On Care, Performative Theology, Mosiah, and a Gathered Community. And she's currently a doctoral student of philosophy and religion at Bangor University, writing on the charismatic bodies in the Book of Mormon. So Jenny, thank you. Thanks, Kylie. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen real quick because I've got a couple of slides. Okay, is that sharing? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, okay. And I'm not gonna actually play the slides because when I do that, like you all disappear and it gets a little confusing for me as to where I'm at with Zoom. So I'm just gonna click through. Um, I wanted to thank Kylie for the invitation to be here today. I, um, I love Steve Peck's work and I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about it. So I um, have titled my remarks, Prisca Sapientia and Stephen Peck's Knowledge Machine. Um, and we'll get there as we're going through everything. So this winter, I read an engaging book by Michael Strevens, who proposes a reading of the history of the science or a history of science that philosophically grounds the emergence of the modern discipline in a particular kind of irrationality. And a central figure in this reading is, of course, Newton, whose interests ranged far beyond mathematics and physics into alchemy, biblical hermeneutics, prophecy, and theology. In short, Newton was interested in everything that might potentially illuminate the inner workings of the universe. Strevens details how some historians have, in light of Newton's endeavors, attributed to him a belief in the Prisca Sapientia, or ancient wisdom, a profound knowledge of the nature of things supposedly grasped by sages in ancient times and passed on elusively and allegorically by figures such as Pythagoras and Plato. To decode the wisdom takes the sensibility not only of a physicist, but also of a philosopher and a poet. Newton's writings on physics, philosophy, alchemy, and scriptural interpretation indeed seems like fingers reaching for the Prisca Sapientia in any and every possible way. So in my copy of the book, the pages in this section contain one word, which appears several times and each time it's followed by an exclamation point. And that word is peck. <laughs> I just, reading this, I was struck um, by the similarity between this figure that Stevens describes and Stephen Peck. And my thoughts today center around this thesis that what we find in the literary works of Stephen Peck evidences a man who, like Newton, also seeks the Prisca Sapientia, an ancient form of wisdom befitting the scientist slash philosopher slash poet, befitting, in other words, Stephen Peck. 
Part of what makes Peck's literary work distinctive and worthy of recognition lies in his ability to remain fully committed to a plurality of truths, each operative in their distinct rhetorical registers. Peck's work in its breadth of both subject and form exhibits a creative commitment to experimentation as a mode of thought and an ability to hold different and even conflicting results in harmonious tension. His commitment to the realm of science as a wellspring for compelling literary questions is notable, but his willingness to extend his texts beyond the boundaries for truth established by the scientific revolution and back into the literary itself, a move that legitimates the realm of the literary as an additional source for truths, is uncommon. And at root, I would argue, drawn from the rich theological soil of Peck's Mormonism. In short, part of what is striking in Peck's work lies in the way in which the literary and the scientific are productively mixed and mingled in the pursuit of knowledge slash knowledges. So in the time that remains, I want to take a few minutes to look at Peck's Incorrect Astronomy, a collection of poems published in 2013. The compression of poetry foregrounds the types of tensions I've been trying to articulate in intriguing and unexpected ways. So consider the poem After the Angel's Command, which Peck writes through the hypothetical first person voice of John Dee, a 16th century mathematician, astrologer, and alchemist who, through another man named Edward Kelly, acting as the scryer, spoke with angels. So before the poem begins, Peck sets the stage for conflict, noting that, quote, after a time, the angel told Edward and John to swap wives for a night. Kind of unexpected, ah, oh, there's gonna be tension. So the poem proceeds in Dee's voice as he laments the apparent silencing of astrological heavens and alchemical signs before recalling the glorious days in which the hidden wisdom of the angels flowed to him through Kelly as the scryer. Ah, but good Edward, were not those days to remember? The angels speaking words dripping and dancing with elemental keys of Promethean secrets. You spoke the lingua adamica, divine knowledge, liber lagoth, logaith. I'm not always sure how to say the word, sorry. Your words streamed through the crystal and portaled other worlds. Where did they go? Where are Raphael, Uriel, Aeneo, and Michael, our Enochian guides? Where are you? Dear Edward, my scryer, my friend, my enemy. Peck's evocation of the swirling streams of a particular kind of knowledge, a knowledge aligned with the Prisca Sapientia, merges into elegiac meditation on the loss of both access to knowledge and access to intimacy in both friendship and marriage, with D shifting back and forth between these heightened emotions, revenge, anger, despair, and ultimately a desire not just to repair lost relationships, but to regain access to the source of those divine truths. So this is right towards the end of the poem. You'll see the lines, Edward, where are you now? Did we ever draw forth gold from alchemical fire? I don't remember. The poetic construction of truth is skillfully wrought as Peck joins a past search with a search for the past itself. Multiple truths are poetically evoked, including the underlying resonance with Peck's Mormonism in the poem's thematic reworking of the relationship between Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, whose own days never to be forgotten, likewise fractured when encountering unconventional relations. Peck's ability to engage multiple histories and thus, thus rereads conceptions of truths within multiple registers, the historical, the scientific, the psychological, and the theological. No answers are provided, either for Dee and Kelly, nor for Joseph and Oliver. And as readers, we are asked to accept the tension of this irresolution as its own form of truth. Peck holds both the scientific worldview and the magical worldview together throughout Incorrect Astronomy. The poems themselves are gathered into three sections, part one, Under the Stars, part two, 
Among the Stars, and part three, Beyond the Stars. The poems move from the mysteries of science on Earth out into the universe via science fiction and ultimately into what can only be described as the theological, a trajectory that illustrates the various modes through which Peck seeks access to truth. Consider, for example, the brief shouting poem, Incantation. So it is written in all caps. Uh, this is not just my bad typing. So darkness, darkness on the face of the deep, chaos and doubt slice through and weep, canticle, canticle, sing them to sleep, light of the morning towards you I seep. Hear me, O oh heavens, listen, sweet hell. No more in your dichotomy will I so dwell. With this, I break you and bind you and fell all old beliefs with this scientific spell. The sing-song chanting rhythm and full rhyme quartets grant incantation a particular pre-modern innocence. These words would be equally at home in the mouths of the weird sisters or Mary Lennox and Dick and Sowerby, and equally powerful in either. Throughout the octet, the speaker evokes a fluid sense of oppositions, darkness and light, sleep and morning, hearing and listening, heaven and hell, breaking and binding, all culminating in the final juxtaposition between old beliefs and science. As a sign for the pre-modern, pre-enlightenment, pre-scientific worldview, the old beliefs are not, however, established as a space into which Peck wants to return. At the same time, incantation fails to establish modern scientific rationality as the desired destination. Rather, the concept of dichotomy itself is deconstructed in the notion of the scientific spell a concept that is in fact empty and void of meaning from a modern post-enlightenment perspective. To be scientific now is to be explicitly against power structures and truths derived from a magical enchanted worldview. And it is precisely the demand for this dichotomous structuring of truth's source that Peck so aptly deconstructs in these eight lines. I hope in these brief readings from the very, that the various forms of truths to which Peck's literary works give voice is beginning to take shape. Peck continues throughout incorrect astronomy to explore such tensions, holding them as equally valid scientific, philosophical, and poetic forms of inquiry in a search for the truths, both divine and banal. He pushes the boundaries of the poetic form itself in poems like the complete text of the first 10 volumes of Dr. Fleckwing's very, very short steampunk novels, which is as funny, sharp, and ultimately devastating as the title implies, and A Night in Bar Har Harbor, Maine, which presents a prose fragment that will ultimately be reconfigured into a short story in Peck's later volume, Tales from Pleasant Grove. Peck's poems embodied in content, theme, and form the notion of accepting anything at face value. Instead, Peck's poems consistently pursue an expanded and expansive notion of truth, knowledge, and the aesthetic and represent the ways in which hypothetical and fragmentary can be productively and thoughtfully engaged in a post-secular disenchanted world in order to challenge notions of a universe stripped of mystery. In these poems, I see Peck inhabiting the space economist John Keynes used to describe Newton, quote, the last of the magicians. Peck's ability to rigorously pursue truths wherever they might be makes him into a particular kind of literary magician. A Mormon magician makes his, in his heaven or hell aesthetic eclecticism, yes. But more than this, Peck's words and works are particularly generative in terms of the production of knowledge itself, opening a creationary space for those who engage him in any of the various registers in which he operates. Peck's knowledge machine is one that is voracious in terms of both consumption and production. And it is this particular openness to the world that we celebrate today. So one final poem, a brief coda here to these thoughts. Analytics. I suppose they will say it was mathematics that killed me, but they would be wrong in that. It was not mathematics, but rather the inability to remove my pencil from the paper. 
This inability to remove the pencil from the paper is at heart a true description of Stephen Peck's writerly condition, his mode of being. And as he searches across the universe and beyond for its secrets, I am truly grateful he's chosen to keep that pencil in hand despite the costs. Joining Stephen Peck in his explorations is a journey that I am happy to undertake again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was phenomenal. Um, I have lots of questions scribbled down. So hopefully everyone else does as well. We are going to finish off the panel as part of this discussion today. Um, well, their presentations, they're not done. They don't get to get away that easily. Uh, with George Handley, who's going to talk about Steve Peck, separating the man from the myth. George teaches environmental humanities at BYU. His research in creative writing explores the relationship between religion, literature, and the environment. He is the author most recently of The Hope of Nature and of the novel American Fork. Thank you, Kylie, and uh, thank you, uh, Rosalind, who's not here, and Jenny and Mattathias. Uh, those were wonderful papers. Um, I'm really honored and happy to uh, join everyone on this wonderful occasion. I only wish it were in person. So uh, to properly assess the significance of Steve Peck's many books for our tradition, I think it's necessary to separate the man from the myth. It will not serve our tradition well to perpetuate myths or overblown rhetoric about the very ordinary man that is Steve Peck. We all know that we have too much of this tendency toward hagiography in our culture already. I have known Steve for over 20 years as a close friend, so I thought I would offer my front row seat view of his life and writings to help bring him down a notch or two. I don't have the time to do an exhaustive debunking, but let me just offer two key myth busters. The first myth is this, it goes like this. Steve Peck's imagination is so exceptional, so far ranging and so endlessly creative it can only be explained as a pure gift of the spirit. Now, first of all, we all know this isn't true because some of the things that he has imagined are downright disgusting. The miracle of rat vomit as manna would be exhibit A. And I was actually a witness to that scene as he was drafting it once upon a time in the basement of my house. And I remember finding it very difficult to get through. I did not find that edifying. And so that, should be enough reason to put this myth to rest. I mean, sure, I was actually oddly inspired by Gilda's story, but we all know that the story was based on a lie, a false rumor that Steve started on the internet about the amazing untold story of this exceptional Mormon woman, world badminton champion and poetess. We all wanted it to be true so badly that Steve gave us what we wanted. Exhibit B might be another woman who believes she is abducted by aliens but who can describe nature with such power it makes you want to weep. I mean, that's just weird. Steve's endless spinning of tales is a function of our human desire, maybe even our deep human need to believe in possibilities beyond the surface of lived experience. So it isn't so much his exceptional imagination that should draw our attention, but our incredible hunger for it. As has been my experience with so much of his fiction is always a crushing blow to come to the end of the story and realize, like Don Quixote, that it was all an illusion. I don't know about you, but having to turn back to my ordinary and bland Mormon life just pisses me off after I read Steve Peck. And it makes me mad at Steve for seducing me. Scholar of Moab, tales from Pleasant Grove, wandering realities, I could go on. They're all lies. And I also know it isn't pure spirit because, well, I don't know how to put this delicately, but Steve just isn't very orthodox. He goes off, for example, in priesthood meetings about temple work for Neanderthals and the beauty of ants and acts all surprised and hurt when 
he looks around the room and everyone is awkwardly wishing to change the subject. <laughs> Besides, I know for a fact that I am more righteous. I mean, for starters, I don't even talk about things I really believe in in church so as not to offend. And I don't have his imagination. In fact, I have spent my life fasting and praying for his creativity, and all I end up doing is envying his. So if it isn't pure spirit, what explains his imagination? I have two theories. Mormon reality, especially in Pleasant Grove, let's be honest, is so utterly bland that only highly innovative skills of imagination are suited for survival. And BYU is so utterly corporate, so quantitatively obsessed with achievement, and so cautious that only a biologist who writes fiction worthy of promotion in the English department can remain intellectually alive. Steve has simply had to reimagine many times over the meaning of his faith and of his science in as many genres as are available at his disposal to keep them alive. His exceptional imagination is a measure of his exceptional desperation. And secondly, if you were almost killed in a car crash on your honeymoon and had to spend the rest of your life dealing with physical struggles, including apparently the worst back on the planet, and if you were later almost killed by a virus that made it into your brain and caused you to hallucinate for two months before a doctor was finally able to give you a proper diagnosis and cure, you might also have an outsized imagination of the horrible and twisted ways in which reality can fool us, as well as the surprising ways in which grace and humor and goodness are nevertheless still miraculously available to us. Now, I'm not saying Steve doesn't have a spiritual, doesn't have spiritual inspiration. I know he does. I recently heard him describe a time when he was set apart for calling while he was a lost soul in the army, and he felt an electric current through his whole body that transformed his consciousness. In fact, I would go so far as to argue that for Steve, imagination and the spirit are synonymous or they at least have the same transformative effect on how and what we see. So if his imagination isn't the gift of pure spirit, I have to admit, despite my disgust at rat vomit, or maybe because of it, I have come to learn from Steve's fiction something about the sanctifying and atoning power of the imagination in the face of even life's most torturous twists. Whether or not it is a gift of pure spirit, it is certainly a gift. And I believe all good gifts come from God. So I guess you would have to say that Steve my, Steve's mind is a gift from God, even though it is so mired in a mucky and twisted and sometimes bland reality, it always manages to catch beauty and grace and holiness. And that gives me hope. Okay, myth number two, it goes like this. Steve's Peck, Steve Peck's writings are so extensive covering science, theology, philosophy, poetry, children's fiction, short and long fiction, science fiction, magical realism, and horror, he should be an arrogant SOB. The fact is, he isn't. Uh, well, sorry, the myth goes like this. The fact that he isn't an arrogant SOB can only be explained by a practiced, disciplined, and intentional humility. Now, believe me, I have felt tempted to believe in this myth. I have poked and prodded and tried to find the real Steve under the surface of all that warmth and kindness and deep humility, not to mention his ridiculous generosity. How ridiculous is his generosity? Well, let me give you an example. I have written one novel, one, not, not many, zero books of poetry, zero books of short fiction. It took me six years to come up with a plot for one novel, about a scientist, no less, and my novel ends up being filled with mistakes due to my really amateur sense of botany. Steve read a really rough and bad draft of the novel, and he told me that someday people would be writing dissertations about it. Now, just for comparison, Adam Miller read the same draft of my novel, and his response was, it has a heartbeat. Now, that was a bit rough to take, and I laughed, and I told him that I preferred Steve Peck's version of how the novel read for him. And Adam assured me in his inimitable Zen-like way that I could believe Steve if I wanted to. But Steve has played that role in my life for over 20 years. No one offers me more encouragement and praise about my writing with the possible exception of my own mother. <laughs> I know that I am not the only recipient of his generosity because I have seen him pour out compliments 
to everyone he knows like a bartender at happy hour. I know he has said similar things to Adam. Adam just has more Buddhist wisdom not to listen. Now, I'm not saying Steve has no ego there or that there's no driving ambition behind all those books. Like all writers, Steve wants desperately to write something that matters, maybe even more than most. I believe his prolific output is a measure of that desperation, but I don't consider that arrogance and I don't consider it vanity. It's passion and vision and belief in the significance of what he has experienced and come to understand. And to honor that with a prolific outpouring of experiments upon the word is not arrogance, but faith and a proper humility that seeks to honor life's gifts. Steve is not impatient with reality. You might think he is, but he just sees it more deeply and accurately than most of us, and he hates being alone. I can't count the number of times I have read him and felt that he has succeeded in completely converting me to a sense of reality that I had completely ignored or mistakenly thought I might dislike. Now, here's a true confession, and Steve knows this. I was asked to write a blurb for Scholar of Moab uh, on the back of the book, and I declined. I had already written a blurb for Tory House Press's very first novel, and so I used that as an excuse. I just said that I thought it looked bad to have the same person on two books in a row. But the real reason was that I had been given a description of the plot, and I panicked. I was afraid that I would read the book and hate it, because the plot seemed really weird to me. And then I would have to end up praising a book by a dear friend that I simply found bizarre. And boy, was I wrong. I cried almost nightly as I read the book, mostly tears of uncontrollable laughter, but also some of awe at the strange beauty of Steve's world. In fact, the power of Steve's fiction is that you can never tell if you are reading tragedy or comedy. So I regret saying no. And I thought that I could here offer a blurb that I wish I had written. So this is my blurb for Scholar of Moab. Dear reader, your world is about to change fundamentally and for good. I mean for good in both senses. You will never be the same after you read this and you will, and you will be better for it. By the time you finish reading this novel, you will come to understand that your sense of what is beautiful, what is holy and what is possible has been utterly inadequate. This knowledge will descend upon you like a gift from heaven. It is what we call wisdom. I guess after Jenny's paper, I would say it is what we call Prisca Sapientia. But. And one last debunking of the myth about Steve's humility. Like all, hum like all Mormon writers, he has to deal with the injustice of an, America, of an American literary establishment that cares little for Mormonism and a Mormonism that cares little for literature. We have often complained together about this indifference. Sure, he wants fame, but not for the untold riches it brings, but for the chance to change hearts and minds. I remember one conversation when he and I decided that the only strategy was to bombard these walls of indifference with enough evidence of significance that eventually those walls would come down. Working with a writing group in my basement in about, I don't know, what was it, Steve, 2001 or so, uh, I remember thinking prophetically to myself that Steve would someday deserve to be a household name. Few, if any, in our faith tradition, few, if any, in our faith tradition are more deserving of praise for launching such a serious and sustained attack on so many different fronts on that indifference than Steve Peck. And few people, frankly, can maintain his relentless pace. I know I can't. When and if those walls come tumbling down, future writers, writers will know whom to thank. I wanna personally thank Steve for breaking me open to worlds of wonder that have forever changed the way I experience life. My career at BYU and as a writer is unimaginable without Steve Peck. He has taught me more about science and about literature and about theology than anyone I know. And even when we aren't in direct conversation, I'm always talking in my mind with Steve. I cannot adequately describe what it's like to read the work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of, uh, this was supposed to be funny. Damn it. <laughs> okay, let me start this sentence over. I cannot adequately describe what it is like to read the work of such an essential and dear friend. But when I do, you would think that I am always aware of the man behind the curtain. But the truth is that in reading the, 
reading, Steve, the myth and the man become so blurred, they are one. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was beautiful. And I'm sure Steve is, well, Steve, you can, if you can speak. <laughs> um, we were gonna have Steve read to us a little bit, or you can take time right now and respond, wh whichever you would prefer. Oh my, this was really, really moving to me on so many levels. I mean, okay, George, you wreck this now. I'm, 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 I'm totally undone with, with, with my tears are now, now, now going. Um, Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm filled with a kind of gratitude for the kindness, um, that I, I sense here. Mattathias brought out, um, some works that aren't seen very often. And I was really grateful for that. The, 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 um, the, the, the online science fictions that I've done are, um, I, I think unseen qu quite a bit because they're in such obscure places and that he dug them out and, and offered this, this sense of really what I try to do with ecology and relationships was, was, was really, really moving to me. Um, to, to have those recognized and, 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 and recommended. And um, Jenny, I do not know what, I would not be a writer without Jenny. I don't think anybody knows it, but she edited Gilda Trillum and Pleasant Grove Stories. And that was a tremendous act of service. And um, I'm not sure I have the power, but I'm pretty sure it's close to, to offer you the celestial kingdom now as, you know, like the guys who carried people across the across the, 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 the river in, in the winter. It was, it was a similar effort. If you've seen me unedited, it's, it's, it's really, it's really um, frightful. Um, probably much like eating rat vomit. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and, and um, so I'm grateful for that. That needs to be publicly said and, 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 put on YouTube forever because because Jenny's role in my life is profound and important and the, the, the efforts that she put into that were were so appreciated and so necessary. Uh, so thank you. I do appreciate that and, and George has got me all messed up now. I when when the, the man for the myth uh, came up. I, I was sure he was going to tell stories about my fly fishing with him when I kept falling in the river and I couldn't, it's supposed to be on film. He was being filmed for a documentary and I'm fishing with him, but I keep falling in and I keep, I can't stand up and I keep falling in and, and, and I remember, I'll never forget George's comment. I have never seen anybody fall down so much. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. Uh I, I I used to make fun of you about that, but then I then I learned that some of your troubles stem from your accident after your honeymoon. I thought that's not fair. <laughs> no, no, it's I, I'm just naturally clumsy. I mean, there's there's great truth in the in in the inability for me to stand up and and, and walk. And so, um, I'm really grateful for 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 the things you said because it's true. Our friendship has been an important part. And, and if you take anything from this um, conversation, it's go read American Fork. It's underappreciated. It is one of the most amazing books. It covers so much territory. It's so beautiful. George's descriptions, the botany is flawless as far as I can tell. Uh, since I'm not a botanist, I, I don't know who gave you that evaluation, because, but I, I, didn't, I didn't see those problems. And it's a wonderful
geography of cultures. It's um, so there. There from my panel, what you should do is take 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 the recommendation to go read American Fork. That's that's the most important what thing. What I mean about is generosity. Like Steve, this is about you. Stop. <laughs> no, no. This is this is my chance to 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 promote. And I told George this story. I was at a conference in Oregon when I when I finished reading it. I'm I'm standing around all these people. I mean, kind of in a, in a little park, a little enclosed park with with people walking around, and I'm just bawling. I mean, just literally bawling. As, and, and people are passing me, looking at me. It um, was. George, you embarrassed me. To, you should have warned me. You should have said that the ending's a little, little bit moving, and maybe you don't want to read this outside in front of others. And uh, I, I, I blew that. And I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I have to say something about Kylie too. She is one of my favorite people. She is a deep thinker. I and and um, go read her Alma book. Seriously. Talk about tears, oh my gosh. It's, it is a wonderful, wonderful work. Um, I'm, 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 she's, a, she's another mind of such, such um, capacity and generosity that, that it's, it's, she helps me see the world in new ways in that way, so. And um, now we'll have to interrupt, though, because you can't just keep praising everyone else, although it does prove George's point perfectly. Um, and, and mind you that he thinks my students are brilliant as well. So I think I'll just throw myself you know, in. With that that reflects the teacher a lot, so. <laughs> um, let's, Steve, do you want to read a little bit or can we, should we move to some? Do you want me to, to, to read? This is from, um, um, it's from my new novels coming out, I guess next year. It's, it's called Hike, Hike's Void. Um, and what I, I was just gonna do a little reading of that. And, um, and, and, and I have to say, let me tell you a little bit about this. This, this novel is, um, it, 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 it's been, as, I, as, as, as George, Minch, George mentioned, I put this up on um, by common consent in little stories that uh, uh, sort of gave little vignettes of, of, of Hike. Hike is not like Gildren. It's a series of vignettes like a, a regular novel. And um, and it, it, it went, my favorite comment, though, on by common consent, was that I did about four of these posts, and then finally I revealed that this was a fictional character, uh, and uh, th there were people from the the the, the um, AML asking about that we needed to know more. That's when I started feeling bad, when people were really taking it seriously. And so I, re I, I revealed that it, was, it wasn't true. Um, and uh, my, my favorite comment though, was somebody said, um, I am so disappointed in by common consent for, for, for pulling the, 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 the wool over our eyes. And then he or she said, when I go to the internet, I expect to find truth. And I remember thinking, Oh dear, <laughs> this is going to be going to be trouble. And um, so, so this novel it it almost died. Uh, I I had I had written it, and I I I was you know I was it was I had actually kind of abandoned it because something was wrong with it, and I couldn't figure it out. And I was at the uh, Maxwell Institute meeting. And Becky Rosler asked me what I was writing. And I said, well, I got this novel, but it just, it's, I, I, I'm not sure I'm gonna pursue it. And she said, well, send it to me. And I said, okay. And I sent it to her and she came back and she said, well, first the ending really sucks. And that's the kind of advice I really need. And, and then she said, the Nephi you've pictured here is two dimensional. Nephi is one of the main characters 
of the of the the novel. And she said, this it doesn't it doesn't work at all. And this for me has been my life experience in how much I rely on a community of other writers to make my things better. And without that, I wouldn't be here. I, and so I've got to express gratitude. I've had, I've had uh, 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 friends and writing groups. I've been in writing groups since I was a graduate student who have, have, who have really built. And I, I just want to add that, that there is a whole community that, that has surrounded me and helped me and blessed my life in, in ways that I can't really express my gratitude over the course of my entire writing career. So I have, I, I'm playing into George's myth here about being generous. I'm not really that generous. I should just, maybe I should spend a few minutes talking about the people who thwarted me and who, who attempted to destroy me and, 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 and worked against my interests in, in, in ways, because it really has been the, the Steve Peck of myth really is a community effort i mean this is this is this is the truth of the matter so um thank you all who who who, who have helped me so should i read a little bit i have powerpoints <laughs> so this is unusual i'm not going to read a, a big section i'm going to read little pieces of the first half of the of the book um, just to give you a sense. I know that's really weird, but let's see if this works. Um, my students always are stuck with me trying to share my screen and it just kind of breaks down all the time. Okay. Oh, I don't think I have permission. Do I need, do I, I think I might need somebody to tell me that I'm authorized. I'm, I'm bon I've got bona fide credentials to do this. Let's so this was the novel that I almost just. I'm able, I'm able to share, so I don't know why you wouldn't. Let's see. You should be able to. There should be a green button at the bottom of the screen. Share screen. Okay, I go there and let's see. Let me try this. I guess I have never given Zoom permission to share my screen, which is odd that I've, because I've been teaching with it. Okay, it's, it's not here. So I'm just gonna read them. The PowerPoints are just text. So this will be better because when I see my mistakes, I can just correct them on the fly. Okay, so this is Hike, Hike is Void. The, the opening thing gives um, some dates for some things that come into the, the novel. So, so electroconvulsive therapy, first try, 1938. Third major ep epidemic of sleeping sickness transmitted by tsetse flies begins in 1970. 26th Amendment, lowering the draft age to 18, June 1971. The Badermannhof gang bombing a Frankfurt Officers Club, May 1972. Uh, one man was killed in that, and that was my mom's cousin, actually. So this is this has got a little relevance. The Fall of Saigon, April 1975. New York Times first mentions AIDS epidemic, 1982. I Want to Know What Love Is is released by Foreigner in November 1984. And Monticello, Utah Temple is dedicated in July 1998. So here's the first one. This is, these are our consecutive chapters, each, each little um, paragraph I write, read. So I'm not reading one long text, which might be better, but a bunch of little ones. There are those God hates. He just does. It is as inexplicable as his love. He hates them passionately and with all his heart, which is an immense heart loaded with both spaciousness and transcendence and the closeness of infinite eminence. So this hatred is not just a large and pure, is as large and pure as can be imagined, or frankly, more than can be imagined, the platonic form of hate. Next chapter, Heike's voice. He laid back 
for just a second moment, fell into a dream or vision. He was still there, sitting on the bank of the dry stream, but the little river was filled with water. Above the moonlit water hovered a heavenly being. It was the angel Nephi from the Book of Mormon. Arrow was somehow able to intuit. Arrow was somehow able to intuit. Nephi, why not Moroni, the same who appeared to Joseph Smith and showed him where the Book of Mormon plates were hidden? Well, Nephi would have to do a little disappointing, actually, Arrow thought like he was getting sort of a second-rate angel. Next chapter. The angel Nephi watched as Arrow clambered after the hedgehog. He shook his glorified head in sorrow as he watched him tumble slide down the hill in a frantic exuberant display of drug-infused joy. Nephi did not feel angelic. He sat down in the gully on a large rock and put his face in his hands. Next chapter. Heike is now far away from her parked car. The sun is high and starting to descend towards the west. The sky is deep blue and she knows she must start back. She sits down, she sits now on a log, a tree long ago fallen and Greyorg licks her hand, reminding her that he is there with her. She is calmer now. She thinks about Paul without panic. She remembers his face, his caress, Absent-mindedly, she strokes Georg's head, and she thinks about how when it came down to it, she could not kill the woman. Next chapter. Elder Holmberg is on his knees pleading with the Lord. He is in agony, having just set apart a new stake president for the bluff stake. It went down like this. He made a decision between Monticello and Bluff that he would set apart Bishop Jimmy Wendell. He was a good man. He ran the Purina feed store and knew most of the community pretty well, especially on the farming and ranching side of things. Next chapter. And it came to pass that Arrow was sitting in the military's bases enlisted men's bar when he learned about the death of the American officer in Frankfurt, Colonel Paul Bloomfield. Next chapter. The goddess, however, I, the goddess, however, will be ready when she was needed again. Heike is loved by God, who hopes to make her a blessing to many. She was broken, though, and still needs help. She is dangerous and vulnerable right now. Next chapter. Are you all right? Alma Loon said, placing his hand on his shoulder. He looked at his secretary as if seeing him for the first time, stared for a moment, and then patted his, the hand on his shoulder. He sighed. Brother Loon, he, he sighed. Brother Loon, I can't get it out of my head. Something is wrong. The spirit isn't happy with me. What's bothering you, Elder? It's that blanding business. I'm not sure the Lord wanted me down to do down there. What the Lord wanted me to do down there, it still feels out of kilter. Next chapter. The goddess Asila screamed when she saw the vicious wound. She reached down and touched the hole in his torso with her fingers. She sensed his life ebbing away. His eternal spirit was ready to depart the broken mortal body. She had failed. This was her fault, a botched responsibility she could not bear. Next chapter, her brain had committed her to the shot, and she was already pulling the trigger when she registered movement in the hole. But it was too late. The bullet was on its way already, and she could not change her mind and communicate it to her finger in time to change the faded tra trajectory. Before the kick had thrown off her view in the hole through the scope, she saw an explosion of feathers and in and about the bowl hole. Next chapter, is he alive? Nephi turned to see who had addressed him. His face became a tragic mask of surprise and hurt and despair and frustration and doubt. Asili. He finally said, have you come to mock me? Nephi fails the test again. He's given one charge, watch over a drug rattled ex-con and he can't even do that. The simplest of tacks, what a fool. Are you done? Yes, goddess, I am done. Is he dead? Nephi stared silently at the still figure on the ground. He finally answered, who can say? The wound is very bad and he is far from help. Next chapter, we moved into a small basement apartment. 
to the world, we looked like a couple of clean cut students living like thousands of Mormon archetypes found all over Provo. But in every sense, he was my husband and I was his. Hike is void. Oh, sorry, that's the title. <laughs> they walked a good ways down talking of trivialities when Arrow asked, well, how do I start? Do I need to confess everything I've ever done or just the big stuff? Leroy got very serious. The atonement of Jesus Christ is very powerful and most things are handled through your relationship with him. Let's not start with sins. Let's talk about his role in your life. If this is to be a proper confession, I want to understand why it matters, why you think this will do any good. Do you have faith in Christ can heal you? The question seemed to surprise Errol. He walked in silence for a while and then said, Next chapter, Alma Loon literally picked up and carried the aged apostle like a bride. He followed Arrow and Leroy through the sage up the incline to the slit in the canyon wall, a high ceiling cave offending, offering shelter. The others followed behind, sag, sagging in the relentless downpour and keeping close together because of the poor visibility. Lightning was flashing every few seconds and the roll and boom of thunder was relentless. And so into the next chapter, so into the rain, Heike and Arrow resolutely marched. For a march of sorts it was, both hunched over their feet, making red divots in the saturated soil with every step, sliding from time to time as they made their way up the valley, trying to keep well above the torrent, splashing and thundering below them in a flash flood of such violence that only a few earthly souls have seen the earth in its unmasked sublime rage so wild and chaotic, you can never tell anyone about the experience without resorting to overused words that in no practical sense capture the noise echoing from that turbulent water in a fervor of elemental madness as forces manic and frenzied, tossed boulders, fragments of sandstone peeling and crumbling off the canyon rock wall until after eons, they slowly slid to the bottom of the valley to now lie in the pillaging creek as the storm unleashed its seething water. Easily pried, titanic slabs of sandstone slide loose from the sediments, cementing these rocks from their static moorings, freeing them to be lifted and set adrift, drift into the chaos as if they were leaves, flitting helter-skelter skelter in a blusterous wind. So that's the first, uh, that's the first, there's two parts to the novel and that is the first, Thank you. That was, we're all excited to read the rest of it. Um, I thought I would ask our panelists today, I was reading it a little before we started, and I read it, this statement by John the Hero, saying, a short story is a writer's way of thinking through experience. Journalism aims at accuracy, but fiction's aim is truth. The writer distorts reality in the interest of a larger truth. And I was wondering how you, if you, well, I think it applies to what Steve writes. Um, and Steve, you can comment on this as well. Um, journalism aims at accuracy, but fiction's aim is truth. The writer distorts reality in the interest of a larger truth. Do you feel like that's what you read in Steve Peck to the panelists or to Steve? Do you feel like you're aiming at truth even if it means distorting reality? Do you want me to, to, to start? Uh, I think so. Um, it's interesting. I, I often tell my students and they never believe it, but I tell them there's more truth in fiction than there is in science. And um, I think I believe that. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm much more, I, I, I get discouraged with um, the, the, the sort of popular tendency to view science as the final arbiter of truth. As, and and the, the, from my perspective, I mean, I mean, I'm deeply embedded in science. I love science. I mean, I'm not, I'm not despairing, disparaging science, but 
the truths of science in some ways are so small and trivial and so focused. And I think that there are bigger truths that matter. And I think that's what I'm getting at when I say that there are, there's more truth in, 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 in fiction than in science. I was going to just comment on the fact that I think um, I've, I, I've always had a little bit of suspicion toward writers who, where I feel like they're being too cute and cr inventive, you know, that there's like too much twisting and turning of, of reality. Um, so dispositionally, I don't actually typically read uh, the kind of fiction that Steve writes actually. And that's maybe sort of why I was teasing myself in my reaction, because I, I don't know, I remember if it was Steve or the editor who had given me a description of the plot. And I was like, what? Of scholar Moab, you know? And I just thought that just sounds way out there, you know? So there's, there's like a, a very conservative, I don't know if it's cautious uh, sort of disposition in me that tends to be suspicious uh, or, or, like I don't want to be pulled along when something feels like it's not documentable, you know, if it's not realistic enough that it resonates with my lived experience. Um, but I, if, for some reason, Steve just, uh, uh, just always pulls it off. I mean, it just feels like to me that um, the, the innovative creative side of his writing where he can, make you feel like walking on in the mountains above Pleasant Grove is a mystical experience with disembodied spirits um, or, or whatever it is, uh, you know, you, and I, and I actually can't, I mean, you end up, I end up not being able to be in a place like the mountains above Pleasant Grove, which are incredible or down in Moab and not, not feel uh like there's, you know, Steve, Steve's now reshaped that world for me so that I anticipate um, sort of seeing, you know, what he's, what he's created. So I, I don't, I have not really been able to put my finger on why Steve pulls it off for me. Uh, I think, but I think maybe a clue is, and I, I've struggled with this also with science fiction, and I don't find this in Steve's writing, but but sometimes f fiction that pushes the boundaries of the, of the real um, starts to lose sight of the human. Like the, the characters don't feel as full, fully human to me. They seem like they're types. And I, he, Steve never cheats that way. I mean, every single one of his characters, you just fall in love with them. And, and I, I think it's because they're portrayed with such authenticity and such tenderness that even though their lives are absurd or their plot lines are absurd in some sense, they're, they're totally, you know, approachable, accessible, tangible, real people to me. And, and that's, that's really what I think is uh, an exceptional accomplishment among many in his writing. Jenny. Um, yeah, I, I think, George, I think you're, you're hitting on something really essential in Steve's, Steve's work. And it's, it's something that I've been thinking about um, in the larger context of, of can speculative fiction uh, approach truth in some kind of way uh, as a genre. And, and I think what Steve's work shows us is that, that it can, it, and it, I think the authenticity that you're seeing there, George, is, is, demonstrative of the fact that Steve, even though he accepts science and scientific truth, he also is able to access older forms of truth. You know, back when uh, something could be uh, uh, true if, if the philosophical argument was sound, you know, and then that would be enough to, to establish that the truth, um, he's, his literature exhibits an expanded notion of truth. And it's not that he dismisses scientific truth, um, but it's, and this is what I see as this really Mormon impulse. It's that he says, the science is true, the literature is true, the philosophy is true. <laughs> like <laughs> He wants it all, you know, and, and, uh, and that's why I, I, I turned to the term voracious when it comes to Steve Peck, both in terms of, of, 
again, like what he's consuming and what he's producing. It's um, he wants everything and he doesn't want it to be inaccessible just because he happens to have been born at a time where scientific, rational, objective truth is the gold standard. So. Matt Athias, do you have a yeah, yeah, I think another two minute response? Aspect, I think another key aspect of this, I definitely agree uh, that there, there's something that rings really solid and true in even Stephen Peck's most uh, strung out absurdist speculative works. Uh, and I think the the ways in which they're right, they always have these dense networks of relationships internally. And also one of the things that I think I, it's, uh, so the quote you read said something about how the, the author distorts reality to capture truth. Um, and I think part of what Steve is doing and part of why his work is so valuable to us is he points us to the ways in which we already distort reality in order to make it more comprehensible, uh, more rational, more reasonable, more to fit better within the confines of our assumptions, right? All of our prejudices and all of our, um, you know, fitting things into pre-formatted categories um, and all of our tendency to reject information that challenges or contradicts our existing worldview and puts that on display, but in a way that by revealing that in his characters, he sort of disarms it for us and says, okay, like, yes, this is what you want to be true. This is what you're trying to construct, but like, wouldn't it be wonderful to be willing to open yourself to something beyond your current framework? Don't you want to be able to encounter something that is outside of your current framework of the possible and admit that it's real? And he does that using tools of the surreal and of science fiction and of magic and of other things, but they get at real experiences that we have where we encounter things that are beyond our own explanatory power. And I think that's what we find in uh, Steve's writing is a, a way to relate and process those experiences even when we can't make sense of them rational, yeah. even when we can't fit them into our predetermined paradigm. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I appreciate Steve being here with us today and all of you who've spoken with us. Um, I, I agree. I think that there's something of emotional truth or I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to describe it in the works of Steve Peck, which then to me turns into a question of how we can teach people to read. And I stumbled across this quote by Bruce Jorgensen from the AML Annual, which I have a copy of from 1996. He was talking about uh, Brian Evanson and some of his works and said, one of my main concerns for several years now has been the conduct of Mormon criticism. How shall I as a Mormon read? How shall I serve my God as a reader? Maybe what I'm saying about the conduct of Mormon moral criticism is simply this, whosoever will lose his life shall find it. Reading, I risk my life to the text, as the Greek word in the New Testament translates as life suggests. I risk losing my psyche, my mind, or my soul. And I thought that was a particularly appropriate challenge for all of us to take on as we read the amazing body of work that Steve Peck has produced.
Thank oh, thanks so much. so much. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve, go ahead. I was just thanking everybody again. I, I'm so appreciative and all the things that were said. It was really no, great. Steve, thank you. <laughs> Well, I couldn't have done it without others, so I'm truly, I'm truly grateful for my community of friends who have helped me on my way. Go, go ahead, Mill. I'm, I'm gonna get really mushy if if we don't. I I, I like you, mushy. Um, that's good. I'm I'm I admire you so much, Steve. I'm so glad that we are that we're friends and that your work is in the world. And I think there are a lot of people here who feel the same. Um, thank you uh, to Kylie and our fabulous panelists for this great conversation. Um, and, um, and thanks to all of those um, in attendance. Um, and we invite everyone to um, join us in, um, in a little under an hour for um, the final act of this virtual AML conference for our um, award ceremony starting at 6 p.m. Mountain. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's good to have you here. And if you haven't read um, a Stephen Peck book, go get yourself one.